Think of strikes and you might picture rail workers or junior doctors. But Matt Damon probably wouldn't have come to mind, yet he is one of a number of Hollywood stars who walked out at the premiere of the movie Oppenheimer as it coincided with the beginning of the announcement of strike action by the Screen Actors Guild. Damon explained the issue at play on the red carpet. You have to make $26,000 a year to qualify for your health insurance. And there are a lot of people who get across that threshold through their residual payments. And so, you know, we can go long stretches without working and, and not by choice, obviously. And, and, and we have to find a way to bridge so that, so that those people who are on the bubble are taken care of. And, you know, and it, it's just got to be a fair deal. We got to get what we're worth. And um, there's, there's money being made and, and it needs to be allocated in a way that takes care of people who are, who are on the margins. Matt Damon there mentioned residual payments. Now, they are the royalties um, an actor receives from the sales of a TV show or movie. And but with the rise of streaming platforms, they have all but disappeared and they want to renegotiate that agreement. Um, of course, Matt Damon is incredibly well paid. He'll do fine without residuals. But his striking is evidence that solidarity within the acting community is pretty high. Josh Hartnett, uh, who was a childhood crush of mine, is also in the Oppenheimer movie. And he made that point at the premiere. I'm not in the room, so I can't say when you see a resolution to it. But I got to say that, uh, you know, collective bargaining only works if the collective is involved. So we're all standing with all the actors out there right now who are, who are doing the bargaining. And uh, we have to we have to stand with our friends who are, you know, uh, trying to make a living in a way in our industry that can be very, very tough. So this is not a guaranteed successful industry. Otherwise, everyone would do it. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who try very hard and and uh, are barely getting by and they need the support of everyone else who, who is doing this. Support for the strike also seems pretty unanimous. The Barbie movie had its London premiere the day before Oppenheimer. The stars and director of that movie were asked whether they would support imminent industrial action. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm very much in support of all the unions and I'm a part of SAG, so I would absolutely stand by that. I would support the actors. I'm a member of the DGA, the WGA and SAG, so I'm I'm all in on everything. That, uh, I love the unions, they've always protected all of the artists I know and, and I, I really want them to um, stand strong and win their fight. It's important to all of us to stand in solidarity with um, with our union. I think it's important. Our union is, the you know, the, the entity that that fights for our rights and fights for the onset rights for everybody. We live in a rapidly changing landscape and uh, it's important to show that solidarity. So you heard them mention SAG there, so that's SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. It's the first time since 1960 that the actors strike is coinciding with a strike by the Writers Guild of America who have been on a continuous strike for two months now. Writers are also striking over the issue of residuals. They want more royalties from the likes of Netflix and Amazon when the movies and shows they contributed towards get streamed. Writers are also concerned about being replaced by artificial intelligence. The writer's strike covers 11,000 people. The actor's strike covers 160,000. So SAG, as I say, the Screen Actors Guild is led by Fran Drescher. She said this as she announced the strike action on Thursday. We are the victims here. We are being victimized by a very greedy entity. I am shocked by the way the people that we have been in business with are treating us. I cannot believe it. The entity she was referring to is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. That body includes the major streamers like Apple, Netflix and Amazon. It also includes the major film studios like Paramount, Sony and Disney. This is what Disney CEO Bob Iger had to say about the strikes. Well, I think it's very disturbing to me. I, you know, we've talked about uh, disruptive forces on this business and all the challenges that we're facing and the recovery from COVID, which is ongoing. It's not completely back. This is the worst time in the world to add to that disruption. Uh, I understand uh, any, any labor organization's desire to um, work on the behalf, behalf of its members to get you know, the most compensation, to be compensated fairly based on the value that they deliver. We managed as an industry to negotiate a very good deal with the Directors Guild that reflects the value that the directors contribute to this great business. We wanted to do the same thing with the writers and we'd like to do the same thing with the actors. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic. 
Now, Bob Iger's call for realism might have been easier to swallow for writers and actors if he wasn't personally paid $20 million a year. To discuss the strikes, I'm joined by Amru al a screenwriter who's a member of the Writers Guild of America. Welcome to the show. Um, can you explain the issue about residuals? So that seems to be key um, to both of these strikes, the actors and the writers. A lot of writers, you know, a couple of decades ago um, could maintain their income through residuals. So essentially what usually happens is you write an episode for a television show, um, which is quite a hard gig to get. You know, a lot of really advanced writers probably can't even get one a year, right? But the reason that being a writer can be sustainable is because every time the network syndicates that episode to another channel abroad, you're owed royalties. And to be part of the WGA, you need to earn about $40,000 a year just to keep your health insurance. And residuals has been one of the main ways that writers who might have had a you know, tricky few years not being able to get work can continue their work. Um, obviously, what happens with Netflix or Apple or Amazon or HBO Max is it's a streaming platform that exists around the world. So once you're paid for your script, they own it in perpetuity and famously no streamer ever reserves um, reveals its uh, data count, right? So, you know, you may have written an episode that's watched a hundred million times or, you know, not at all, but you've just been bought out, right? And so as a result, writing has become much more of a gig economy now. You know, you really have to work from script to script because there is no lasting residual payment. And that's sort of the fundamental issue at stake at the strike. It, it, it's made work incredibly precarious, um, fundamentally. Um, and, you know, I know writers in their 40s and 50s who've bought houses and have a comfortable life from two episodes they've written from a network show a while ago. And now you can write four episodes a year and still be working from paycheck to paycheck. So that is what streaming has really undercut. Um, and that's, I think, the core tenant of the strike. Is the demand that, you know, Netflix and Amazon and all these platforms show how many people are watching each of the shows and then give writers and actors sort of a, a fee every time it gets watched? Is that sort of what, what people want? This is sort of what's being negotiated. I mean, I can talk from personal experience. So I wrote uh, on a show for Apple about four years ago now. And just to, you know, be really blunt about it, it was a 30 grand, $30,000 trip fee. That obviously sounds like quite a lot. Agent and lawyer's fees are uh, about 25% in America. You give, I think, 2 to 4% to the WGA, and then there's tax. So it comes down to about $13,000, which is about £10,000 right now. Um, that was for writing a script from October 2018 to April 2019, which is you know a lot of hours. And when you break it down per hour, it's really, really low. The script, you know, was was filmed, went on to Apple. The episode was a $4 million episode. So the writer's fee was really a very, very minimal aspect of that budget. Goes on to Apple and that's it. You know, it's it's on there. It can be watched in 190 countries. I have no idea how much it's being. Uh, and I get a very, very small residual rate of about $800 a year, which is, you know, minimal given, you know, the proliferation of the episode and actually was BAFTA nominated and, um, you know, there's been a lot of success. And that one was actually quite upsetting because it was a queer Arab story and that, you know, was really, really personal to me. And, you know, as the queer Arab writer, I think I was sort of paid the least. And so I think what's up for negotiation right now is, yeah, residuals based on how much the episode's been consumed, how much it's been on the air you know, how many territories it's been in. I mean, what's kind of interesting is a show like Bridgerton, which has, we know, you know, just tens of millions of viewers. If I was to write an episode of Bridgerton, I'd probably get the same rate as I would for any other Netflix show and no residuals, even though it may have been consumed a hundred million times. And so, yeah, writers aren't getting, um, and, and actors are just not getting paid for the success of their own writing. So that's one I mean, there's loads of different aspects of the strike we can talk about as well. But that's one of the main issues at stake. I know AI is another one. So talk to me about AI. Screenwriters, I mean, are you worried that you're, you, you could be replaced by artificial intelligence? I think that's obviously like a headline term. That's not what I'm worried about. What's actually happening is if a show gets greenlit, 
you know, let's say I was to write a pilot for ABC, they green, green, green lit it to series, all of a sudden I would have to try and get 20 episodes ready for production. And the way that you'd usually do that is hire a lot of writers, you know, maybe 10 to 15 in a writer's room to, you know, work for six months, um, you know, at a weekly rate of maybe $10,000 per, per, per writer. And every writer would also get to write a script, which might be, let's say, you know, $50,000, which means that they would get their health insurance and that would be set up for the year. That is obviously quite pricey for a studio, though they do have the money. And so what's actually being talked about is really reducing the number of writers in a writer's room. So let's say from 10 to 15 to about four to five I would still write the pilot and AI would be used to generate really simple, well, currently quite schematic stories that followed a formula. So especially for things like cop shows or law shows, or shows where there's a lot of existing data out there, um, it would be quite easy for AI to just generate simple story structures. And then the writers in the room would be asked to do what's called a polish, which is basically to just pump up the dialogue, make it funnier, whatever. A polish fee is about $5,000 rather than $50,000 to write a script. So the AI thing is not about being replaced, but it's about just reducing the cost of the writer for the studio. And so, you know, that's just getting rid of loads of jobs and also, you know, polish fees. I've been I've done polish fees before, you know, $5,000, there you go. And so that is what's currently at stake. And they are not budging on that one. It's just so much cheaper for the studio. I mean, they, they ultimately need the writer to write the episode, but if it's technically a polish, they just have to pay way less um, just legally. Can I ask you about the the unions here, I suppose? And I think many people, I mean, myself included, really, when I think of LA and I think of Hollywood, I don't think of, you know, solidarity between superstar actors and um, actors who are struggling to, to make it. I think of sort of individualism and consumerism. So wh- why is it the case that it, it seems that actually solidarity is very strong in this industry. You've got Matt Damon walking out of, of, of premieres to support essentially people who are at the start of their careers or people who are struggling in their careers. How, how does the union system work in, in America? I obviously work as a writer here in the UK where we don't really have unions. And um, I think what you have to understand is that like 99% of both unions are essentially just jobbing actors and writers who are basically working from room to room. Most of the writers in the Writers Guild don't have their own shows. They're working in writers' rooms and that kind of thing. Obviously, just the healthcare system is so different in America. I mean, your union is so tied to just your social safety net in America, of which there is so little in terms of a social safety net. And so, you know, as part of the Writers Guild, you have to earn, I think, about $40,000 a year in order to qualify for the health care that the Writers Guild provides you. And so the union is, A, really protectionist, and I've really uh, come to envy it when I work in the UK, where script rates are a complete joke. There's no kind of protections, that kind of thing. But um, they are much more of a lifeline in the US, given how precarious working life is there and so um you know I, I think people just see it as just part of their just social safety net to be in a union in the u.s because you know health would otherwise be 900 dollars out of your own pocket a year but more and more wga members are losing their health insurance just because of the residuals issue i mean i know loads who are losing their health insurance at the moment it's very easy to lose your health care and also um i, I think the beast in uh, America, it's just a lot more forbid- formidable, you know? I mean, just just, just the, the, the level at which you can be exploited as a worker. I mean, not saying that, you know, it's a socialist utopia in the UK, but, you know, health depends on it. You know, just loads of different kind of rights just depend on how your work is organized in, in the US. So the union really is, and, you know, you're dealing with such a powerful corporate entity, these studios, that I just, it's slightly different in the UK. I mean, we're dealing with the BBC who are not paying us that much anyway. So it's a slightly harder, it's slightly more manageable monster to kind of negotiate. Whereas out there, it's just such a kind of um, survival of the fitness. I, I think, to answer your point, the kind of American individualist sort of Darwinian landscape of what American capitalism is like means that people are so desperately tied to their union just in order to kind of survive the beast is kind of why I think people are so wedded to their union out there. 